I walked in the morning and in the afternoon too, first around the wooded foot of some local hills, along paths that were very muddy because the sun was bringing out the frost, and then round the villages this afternoon, looking at the graveyards and the different houses, all quiet on a Sunday afternoon. You can remember days like this, when everything far or near at hand seems specially graced by the light. Sheep, railway engines, yards, lanes, distant hills, iron gates, drinking cups. It makes me glad to be alive and sets my head humming with all sorts of schemes that will live as long as a gnat. The privilege of being able to walk about on a day like this makes nonsense temporarily of all one's hopes and fears. If Philip Larkin ever came up here, which I imagine he did, possibly with his fiancée, Ruth Bowman, I don't know, it would have been around eight decades ago. It's only five years since I was last up here. A random slice of time, perhaps, but also a very distinct historical era. An awful lot of lateral flow tests and tick-tocks under the bridge. The curtain edges have grown light nearly 2,000 times since then. Snow has fallen. Summer light has thronged the glass. The intricate, rented world has woken up again and again. And it's like falling and recovering in huge gesturing loops through an open sky. It doesn't take any effort, this, on my part. There's no wiki rummaging previously. Then. As now, my mind reverts to Larkin speak. Larkin for me was one of those influences that became permanent immediately. Happens like that in childhood and in youth sometimes. Things get us at the right time, the optimum time. I like to think I felt it happening at the time and I can still feel his linguistic consciousness sitting snugly behind mine. A unique random blend, perhaps. Perhaps he would have approved, perhaps not. And speaking of things that Larkin may have liked or otherwise, there's Wellington. The Tower of All Saints, the roof line perhaps a little fuller than last time, the trees having just completed their yearly trick of looking new, sat sweetly as ever under the reeking. The surprise of a small town, if you like. Wellington isn't where Larkin started. That was Coventry, back in 1922. But it's where I'm starting, my closest point of reference, so you get the idea. This film is about Philip Larkin, but it's not going to be entirely Larkin-shaped. We're going to keep getting in the way. And that's entirely appropriate. That's how art happens. It collides with us, with everything that we are. I remember when the lights came on at four, at the end of another year, 1987 it was, when Larkin first swam into my consciousness on a belated, half-hearted A-level English course at Stourbridge College, after two years of walking round the Rye Market and lunching on whisper bars on the wall of St Thomas's Church. So yeah, this film is going to be quite Larkin shaped, but it's going to be a bit Dan Cummings shaped too maybe even a bit Lee Harris shaped. Some people don't like that. Not my shape or, or Harris's shape, although there probably are lots of people who don't like either of our shapes. But I mean muddying the waters with yourself. But I think it's dishonest to aim for purity when discussing art. If you're talking about the creator versus the receiver, it's the latter that's doing all the movement. If a poem falls in a forest, and there's no one there 
to pick it up and read it. Well, the art remains the same. We make it change by changing ourselves. Coming up for air by George Orwell is a completely different experience in relation to whether you're younger than, the same age as, or older than its protagonist when you read it. The art remains trapped in an eddy beneath that sun-dappled bridge. Pieces break off, things become attached to it. Time transfigures it into untruth. I said I was going to stop doing that to myself earlier, that larkin speak, but I'm not. So before we begin to delve in the town itself, let's get something out of the way. Not quite the elephant in the room. Sounds too exotic, not English enough. You can see Larkin, overweight and shifty, in that famous photo on the English border, can't you? Maybe the cow in the room. My original appreciation of Philip Larkin was devoid of any other context other than my own. I react to it in the same way as I react to a medieval park closed screen in the smoky stillness of a church in the Lincolnshire Fens, to a, a flag unfurling on a bright February afternoon in the South Downs. If you're the kind of person that thinks that someone holding views that you find untenable renders them incapable of artistic greatness, then I suppose you must, by the same token, believe that someone holding views that chime with your own renders them automatically capable of artistic greatness. Well, I'm sorry to be the one to have to break it to you. The comedian Stuart Lee talks about how, at the moment, we don't necessarily enjoy comedy, we just like to agree with it, and tastes change. The Elizabethans like their spoilers, just as we do not. The wheel turns. It's turning now. It's just that, like those leaves, with their yearly trick of looking new, it's happening too slowly to see or hear. Given the ambiguity, stroke, ambivalence of Larkin's purported feelings about the place, God only knows how Larkin would have felt to have been commemorated thus. In all honesty, Lee, how would you feel to be commemorated by a, a, a plaque on the side of a building? My name is very common. Um, there are two people with exactly the same name ah, as me right. from yeah. the area of Wolverhampton that I'm from who are yeah. both plumbers. So. To be honest, I'm fairly indifferent to the whole idea. What about you, Mark? Well, as my surname is Petty, and that's generally a pejorative term, I wouldn't be overly fussed if I wasn't commemorated. But, but if I was, I think I'd probably want something sort of culturally relevant, like yeah. a gallery. Yeah, I can see that working. I would be more than happy with, with a Cummings way. And I assume that if I die, as I assume I will, before you guys, you'll come and, and write a, a your between the Cummings and the way. No. Huh? What I would write is, after it, I'd write of the samurai. Oh, Cummings, way of the samurai, because, because you remind me of Forrest Whitaker in Ghost Dog, to, yeah. way of the samurai. Yeah, yeah people, um, people comment on that. Yeah. But of course there is already precedent for this type of thing in Wellington, because as you see, the edge has actually has his own information point. God, he does, yeah. You can ask about whether things go and have done for five decades. Apparently, though, he still hasn't found what he's looking for. <laughs> In 1943, Larkin received a request from the Ministry of Labour asking about his plans post-Oxford. He said that he rightly judged the inquiry a warning that he'd better start doing something. I remember that feeling myself, talk about getting in the way 
of the narrative flow. Here I am again. I remember feeling when I was about 21, 22 that I was suddenly much older than the teenagers I saw in the street. The time was running out for me. It's an illusion, of course. The moment you start work, you catch up immediately. Another thing that I connect with very strongly is, is the architectural style of the house behind me. It's 40 New Church Road, even though it says 28. It's where Larkin lodged when he arrived, uh, probably um, enticed by the proximity to his friend Bruce Montgomery in Shrewsbury as much as anything else. And it looks so much like the house in Robin Street in Preston where my grandparents lived. So many houses of the time. It's like that great swathe in the opening credits of Billy Liar. What a period piece. So reflecting on Larkin's time in Wellington, obviously you know, the very mention of him causes hackles to arise sometimes, doesn't it, because of that line about serving tripe novels to morons, but I don't feel any of that from, from what I've read um, around the issue uh, because we all feel very differently about the places we live in, the places we're from. We're very different people throughout our lives and throughout segments of our lives, aren't we? It's like, you know, Larkin is... He's not always the jowly old man, is he? Sometimes he's, you know, he's a scarf-wearing, round spectacle hep cat, oh. isn't he? You know, and the, the, the jazz dude. And I think that his, his feelings about this place were probably as, as, as varying as, uh, as those things. And he came back, didn't he? He did. He came back on the last three occasions. Oh, three, I thought. And you came back the, in 62. Yeah. On about, I think it was just on. He was passing through the area. He stayed here once when he came to visit his ex-girlfriend. She was then with Bone Rider. Right yeah. And uh, another trip to Shropshire. The Shropshire area may have been through, through to Wales, I think. But, um, yeah, he stayed here at least three occasions. And yeah, and talked about that treasured community spirit, yeah. didn't he? And the lambent sea. That's it. And all of those things. I think as he, as he got further away from Wellington, I think he realised that the kind of the part it had played in both well, yeah. his career as a librarian but also his, his career as a writer. Well I said earlier it's where I was going to start but it was in a way where he started wasn't it because he started he writes all of the North Ship, his first two, well, his only two novels, Jill and the Girl in Winter. I was reading some of the North Ship the other day actually and it's it's very um, adolescent sounds very disparaging but I mean he hated it didn't he? He said it was so um, utterly rubbish that he was um, just as unhappy for two um, copies of it to exist as one. Didn't he buy the only copy in Wellington just he, to get rid of it? He did. There was a copy in WH Smith's in Market Square which somebody had either not claimed or brought back but he saw it there and aghast with horror decided that he better get it before anybody else Brilliant. got their hands on yeah. it. But yeah, very, very Larkin-esque as well, that idea. Did but he yeah. write five novels that he subsequently immediately destroyed? Did he? I'm sure I've read that somewhere. I don't know. I don't know of that. I must admit that sounds... Um... Forgive me if I've got that no, wrong, but I, I think very, I have read that. He was incredibly... He cut his, his, his output um, with, a, with a, a, a fine knife, didn't he? He, he was extremely um, sparing about what he actually published. I know that much, so I don't know whether that's where that came from. But no, I was, I was, I was reading a bit of The North Ship the other day, and even in that... that, that um, you know, in inverted commas, adolescent phase, his, his, his linguistic prowess is beginning to surface, you know, that last line about um, rigged for a long journey under a fire-spilling star and all of that. And, you know, there was a little tug there, I thought. But, of course, he was under the spell of Auden, who he talked about emulating, not because he liked Auden's personality or understood what he said, but because he liked the music of Auden. And I suppose that's so much like when I, when I was in bands when I was a kid, desperately wanted to sound like 
me, not the artist I was emulating, but it just seemed impossible. Mm. Do you remember that feeling yeah. when you were young? Um, and it's like, I remember Michael Palin talking about writing a song called I Will Never Go Beyond the Fringe because he couldn't comprehend the idea of anyone being as, as incredible as Beyond the Fringe. Mm. And of course he himself went so far beyond the fringe and Larkin went so far beyond his Ordinesque yeah. roots. Yeah. And it's, it's, this is his springboard, isn't it? It is, and I think this is the place where, which really helped him find his for want of a better term, is, is adult voice yeah. as a writer. Yeah, I think so. You know, I think the phrase is it sort of moulded his attitudes to life, love and relationships, you know, with everything that happened to him yeah. professionally and personally while yes. he was in Wellington. And he comes back to it in later years in, in, I think it's in the High Windows collection, where he writes a poem about his sort of form to view his, his experiences with girls in yeah. Wellington. So. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, it's, it's, it's obviously an important place, yeah. however, we, we precisely detail his feelings. So, yeah, I think, uh, what was it he said? Um, it's a lovely, lovely ambivalent phrase. Ambivalent phrase. Um, was it? Um, ugly and graceful, a curious little place. Ugly and graceful all at once, was it? Yeah. We all feel that throughout our lives. So here we've got um, a mural dedicated to Philip Larkin. This is one of 12 murals in the town, which you can, uh, if you Google, you'll find the Wellington uh, Maker's Dozen Mural Trail. And uh, this shows kind of a lot of things from Larkin's period in the town. For example, you can see the North Ship, his uh, first collection of poetry in the bottom left, which was partially written between shifts in the library itself. Uh, Larkin didn't such were the Spartan conditions of his uh, his lodgings yeah. that he didn't really like writing there. So Love the he wrote Toad at the bottom. Yeah, and of course the Toad work that squats on his life. Yeah. Of course this was his first professional appointment, so that kind of sort of um, shows the way towards uh, his attitude to work as well in terms of his librarianship. And on the shelves we can see some of the, the books uh, he added to, uh, to the stock. When he arrived the library was in a, in a fearful state, uh, a, a dilapidated state really. Mm -hmm. And he was pretty much helped transform Wellington Library into kind of like a modern 20th century library and did really great work as a librarian in his time here. Yeah, that's the thing that often gets overshadowed, um, aside from the poetry. But you can see titles by people like D.H. Lawrence, and he was accused in mm. some circles of uh, bringing dirty books into the library. Right. It's often the case that people who we think are really old fashioned actually were great modern mm. artists yeah. in their day. Yeah. It's also probably worth mentioning that my wife is from just down the road from where D.H. Lawrence was from and if she doesn't like someone, she calls them a D.H. Lawrence. I wonder if you can work out why. So no longer the library behind us, but still I suppose a split level and splendid extension and as good a place as any to bid farewell to this first point via which we plot Larkin's time in the West Midlands. I'm off to devise my own slow and stopping curve to our next point of embarkation. Moving backwards now, not in straightforward reverse or rewind like Benjamin Button or Time's Arrow, written of course by Larkin's best friend's son, Martin Amis, or even that bit in Plan B, Sick to Death. You remember the bit when the blood from the severely damaged ear climbs back up the cheek and slowly disappears? No? Never mind. 
It's going to be more like a train shunting back into a siding and then moving back forth. It's 1940 again and Larkin, like David Niven in his dying intercom call to Kim Hunter in a matter of life and death, has his education interrupted by the Coventry Blitz, of course. November the 14th. What a terrible night that must have been. His family, who've had Litchfield associations back all the way to 1757 or thereabouts, move here to Cherry Orchard, first to one address and then another. Larkin toddles into town to drink at the George. He also, of course, wrote three poems while he was here. Christmas 1940, Out in the Lane I Pause, and Ghosts. The latter, of course, not to be confused with Japan's 1982 masterpiece. Or, for that matter, with Henry Gibson's masterpiece. Or, for that matter, again, with BBC One's masterful sitcom. It's Out in the Lane I Pause that does the most for me. There's that foreshadowing of his later only life, a little bit dockery and son, the idea that addition means dilution, and there's that line, all that gasping withered air, that seems also to prefigure his later poetic and linguistic consciousness. or the place where he lived, which is the main event today. It's this, the fact that we're rummaging around like Eli Wallach in the closing moments of The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, when he's searching for the unmarked grave next to Arch Stanton. In a graveyard in Litchfield, looking for the final resting places of two people that I never knew and I can scarcely imagine. Sidney Larkin, for all I've read about him, doesn't sound like the kind of guy I would get on with very well. But, ce n'est pas un pipe. As Magritte informs us, a picture of a pipe isn't a pipe, and a description of a man isn't a man. We might have got on like a house on fire. And this reminds us once again to judge Larkin on his work rather than who we think he was. And thank God that's how it works. Thank God I don't have to be a neurotic, acerbic, chaotic, destructive alcoholic in order to appreciate the paintings of Francis Bacon. Thank God I can just look at the paintings and think I like those. Because that, in the long run, is how art works, whether you like it or not. In the long run, I only almost believe that what will survive of us is love. Philip Larkin is dead in the way that flashed afresh to hold and horrify him in Obeyed. But time has not dulled to distance all he was. It's out there in that creative impulse. That impulse to survive after our death either through our children or our art or both. The creative urge that projects ourself into an imagined future. Like an arrow shower sent out of sight, somewhere becoming rain. A strong, unhindered moon. Blurred playground noises beyond black stockinged nurses. Bright knots of rail. The strength and pain of being young. 
vast moth-eaten musical brocade, waking at four to soundless dark, Sunday full and organ frowned on spaces, in whose blent air all our compulsions meet, sun-comprehending glass, the million-petaled flower of being here, crouching below extinction's alp, canal and clouds and colleges subside, age and then the only end of age, audacious purifying elemental move, immobile locked three-handed struggle, ruined bibber, randy for antique, the river's level drifting breadth.